uh, we're dealing with the Enoch law. And I'll show you how this law affects your life. Now, this is the law that came out of the Garden of Eden. Two commandments, only two commandments in the, in the Garden of Eden period. Two commandments. They both affect your life today. The second commandment recorded, the second commandment, which is 217. In the second commandment, <clears throat> from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. A negative, for in the day you eat, dying you will die, is what that says. Dying you will die. <clears throat> now watch this. <clears throat> How many people were in the garden at this time? Two. Two. And yet it affects everybody in the human race. These two people affected the entire human race. Both, both of them did. Eve, the mother of all living. This is going to come out of Genesis 3.15 as a messianic promise. And Adam, death came through Adam, life came through Eve. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> and yet it affects the entire human race. These two people affect the entire human race. From the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not... See, that has low plus the account. You shall not, that's a prohibitive, a negative command. For in the day you eat from it, surely you will die. You will die, abs that surely means absolutely. And he says dying, in the infinitive, dying, you will die. In other words, he's talking about two deaths, about that. Two aspects of death. Like two aspects of eating. Eating, you will eat. Who's going to provide what we eat? God. That's logistical grace. With the second one, we have saving grace. The second commandment is the only commandment in the Garden of Eden period that carried a judgmental consequences to the human race for its violation. Now that's really important because how did... How did I wind up with Adam's sin death issue on my life? How did I issue up? How did I wind up with that? That's a fair question to ask. It is carried in, in 217, it is carried by Adam. The violation, the violation of the of this commandment, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For in the very day you eat from it, dying you will die. Now, here's the point of dying you will die. When Adam ate of the tree, the very day they ate, dying you will die. Agreed? No, that's clear. What was the dying before death? Spiritual. Their spiritual. After Adam ate the fruit, he lived 950 years. Dying, you will die. The dying part is he lost his relationship with God. He spiritually lost a relationship with God that could only be recovered by the blood, you know, the shadow Christology, blood. What I want you to see, though, in this, seven, in this second commandment, what I want you to see is that there is a judgmental consequence to it. Agreed? If you eat, if you're alive, and you participate, if you eat of the knowledge of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the consequences is dying, you're going to die. If you are alive and you are, and you eat of that tree, the judgmental consequences to that is dying, you're going to die. 
Do you understand that? We're going from life to death. Do you understand that? And what part of life did he lose while he was still alive physically? He lost his relationship with God. Where God met with them on a regular basis in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden, where God walked in the Garden of Eden, and they're not in union with him anymore. This is an enormous principle. Listen, I have people, pastors write me when they hear this sermon. They write me, and they say, where do you get this idea of judicial judgment? Well, I get it right there. Judgment, it was judicial. Listen, what happened to us in the human race? There were 13 judicial charges from dying you will die passed on to the human race. 13 judicial charges. There's more than that, but I, I recorded 13 of them in that little pamphlet, 50 things you receive in salvation you can never lose in time and eternity. Now, the one way you can lose those 13 is get saved. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, 13 judicial charges are removed from your life through the, through the judgment. The judgment that was on my life has been put on Christ's life. I believe him, and then those 13 are removed. The judgment on my life is removed through the blood of Christ. Do you understand that? Through his death. He took not only my sins, but my death for sin. He took my sin death. There was a judgmental consequence. Do you see that? I Man, I don't know how to explain it. I, if I die and you will die, do you understand that? That's judgment. That's a judicial consequence to eating. God said, don't eat of the tree. In the day, in the very day you eat of it, you're going to be judged for it. What I did in that little pamphlet, 30 things, I just went in and showed you that there was more. What, what, does it, what is this sin death package? I just did the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin upon the human race for you to understand it. What an awesome thing it was when Christ died for my sin death. In Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 12, it, right, he, uh, Paul wrote, Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, that's who he's talking about, sin entered the world. Where's that? That's Genesis 2.17. And death through that sin... That's Genesis 2.17. And so the sin death spread to all mankind, for all are included in that sin. All have sinned in Adam. All are sinners in Adam. You're not a sinner because you sin. You're a sinner because you're an Adam. If you're an Adam, you're a sinner. If you're in Christ, you're a saint, not a sinner. If you're an Adam, you're a sinner. Do you understand it? Well, I mean, I can't make you believe it. I can only tell you to you. <laughs> but I want you to understand this stuff because people go, where do you ever get this idea that I'm a sinner because of Adam's sin? Well, here it is. This is it. And you should read Romans 5 through 12 through 21. He lays this thing out wonderfully. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, one of the passages I use a lot around here, and I know Willie does, in Adam all die, in Christ all will be made alive. In Adam all die, in the first Adam all are dead, in the second Adam, the last Adam all are made alive. In the first Adam all are made dead, in the second Adam all are made alive. See? So how do I get out of Adam and into Christ? I In the gospel of Christ. My faith in the gospel of Christ. And how am I removed from the domain of darkness? Colossians 1, 1.13. How am I moved? By the grace of God. I am rescued. I am transferred by the grace of God through the work of Christ on the cross. He died for my sins. He was buried and he was raised from the dead to give me life everlasting. I mean, he conquered my sin and my death. 
when he died on the cross and was raised from the dead. So you should read that stuff. You should read that stuff. See, we're connected. In the Garden of Eden, we're connected. We are connected. We are, co we are all part of Adam's family of death until we become the family of God through Christ. In Christ, we become a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17, in Christ, we are a new creation. The second point that I'd like to point out to you, in the Hebrew grammar, there's a difference between an imperative, the, the Hebrews have an imperative, now listen to me, which is a positive command. When you have a Hebrew imperative, an imperative is a command. In the Hebrew language, when you have an imperative, a Hebrew imperative, it carries a positive command. I'm going to show you one in a minute. In the Hebrew, it will have the imperfect tense. It will, the, the Hebrew don't have tenses. They have states, a status. But you're, it's either going to be with low, a neg the negative low, or the negative al, al. That the negative low is, when you see it, it could be an al as well. If you have the, the, the if you have, uh, if you have an imperative, it's a positive command. If you have the prohibitive, the imperfect, it's a negative command. If you have an imperative, it's a positive command. If you have the imp imperfect with low or al, it's a negative command. I think I said them wrong to begin with. In the Hebrew grammar, the imperative is a positive command. The prohibitive imperfect in the Hebrew with lower al, the word not, gives a negative command. In Genesis 2.17, Moses' model, he picks up a model. He writes, this is really important, because you're going to see it in his next book, Exodus. He, he models the Hebrew grammar in 2.17, and he's going to record it. He's going to use it again in the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter, when he, when he, when he, when he writes the Ten Commandments. In Genesis 2.17, Moses' model was a Hebrew prohibitive, imperfect law, Cal imperfect, you shall not eat a negative command with judicial consequences, dying you will die. Agreed? Yes. When that's in, in his first book, Genesis, when he writes his second book in Exodus, he's going to use that model again with the Ten Commandments. Oh, please, look. He's in the Garden of Eden, in the book of Genesis, he writes two commandments. And he establishes a model, a grammar model. Do you got you got that? When he goes to the second book, he writes in Exodus, and he goes to the Ten Commandments. He uses that model. That's really important. You understand the writer in this thing, <clears throat> in the Hebrew grammar. In the Ten Commandments, Moses uses the model, both the imperative and the prohibitive, with the last six commandments. I'm, I'm just looking at the last six because they deal with the man, the man side of the Ten Commandments, okay? You know, there's four and there's six in the Ten Commandments. The, there's the God side and the man side. The man side is do not do this, do not do that, all that business. Now watch this. In the sixth commandment, which is the first on the man's side, there are six commandments. The first of them is honor. You know, honor your parents. Well, I'm in Genesis. Genesis. Let me slide over to Exodus, the 20th chapter. Genesis, 20 chapter. Genesis, 20 chapter. In verse 12, honor your father and your mother 
that your days may be prolonged, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God has given you. And then he goes in a series. Now watch this. Then he goes in a series of shall nots. Not murder, not commit adultery, not, 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 all the way down, right? Got that? All right. Now he's going to use his model that he established. Honor is a PL imperative. In the Greek language, that's a PL imperative. That's a positive command. That's an imperative. That's a positive command. Right? A positive command. Listen to me. All right. Let's go to Ephesians. I'm going to show you this positive command. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to read this one in Hebrews before I go. Uh, uh, honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord God gives you. Do you understand that? Now watch this. Paul picks, this, picks the same idea up out of this model in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and he modifies it to the church age. He brings it into the, dis he takes it out of the dispensation of the Jews and puts it into the dispensation of the church. Well, Ephesians, I know it's in my Bible, sixth chapter, here I am, verse I'm, go I'm going to verse 1 and 2 and 3, all right? 1, 2 and 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is right. Now, he's going to, he's going to go to Exodus, the 20th chapter, verse 12, which is verse 2 and 3. Watch what, now watch what he does. Honor your father and mother. Watch this now. Which is the first commandment with a promise. So that's a positive command. This is a command. It's a positive one. Right? He says it's a, this one has a promise. This is the first commandment with a promise. And here's the promise. So that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Look, that's not... Listen, he modified it. Do you see how he modified it? He brought it out of the dispensation of the Jew into the dispensation of the church. What, what, did he, what, what was the key word in Exodus 20? The land. Which was the big deal, was it? the Abrahamic deal. So that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. There is a promise that Paul brings out of the Ten Commandments, on, brings out of the, and applies to the church at Ephesus. Children, obey your parents. Now listen to me. There's two sides of that. There's the child who is under the parent's authority, period. Listen to me now. And there's the children, there are the parents who are under the authority of their children's period. This is when the children that were under the parents' authority is now grown and have their own families established and now taking care of the parents. See, there's two sides to this. And the promise is extended to both sides of that promise. Children, when you are in the home of your parents, you take, you obey them. When the parents are under your authority in your home, you take care of them. You take care of them. And what's the promise? What's the, my goodness, wouldn't you want to know what? Listen, if I gave 
Wouldn't you like to know that you had a blank check signed that would be good at the bank if you took it and you could write in your own price? They said, well, here, just you write in whatever you think you need and take it to the bank. Yeah, that's how God treats you, you know. Listen to this again. So that I may be well with you, so things may go well for you, and that you may what? Kids, do that in the house. When you have your own house in your own way and your parents have to be brought to you, parents, you need to understand this, that you can bring prosperity to the life of your children when they want to take care of you. Be honorable with that. And children, understand that things will go well for you if you take care of them. And your life will be extended. I, and I tell you, I'm living proof of this. I am living proof of that promise. I am living proof of that promise. My life is. God has brought that thing. You know, that's, that's a chicken that's come home to nest for me. So that first, first one... We would expect something good to come out of that first verse, right? Because it's, it's an imperative. The Hebrew imperative, right, is going to give me a positive command. If it has the word not in it, then it's going to, it's going to be a negative command. Agreed? Because it's got the word not. All of the rest of them are, 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 are low with an imperfect. Now, you know what this means? I'm going to tell you. Because he, he don't have to tell you this because Moses has modeled this. You study the five books of Moses, you're going to get this information. If you study the five books of Moses, you watch for how he models stuff. I tell you this all the time. Look for markers. Writers leave markers. They leave trails for you to follow. And this is one of them with Moses. He does it in Genesis, and he does it in Exodus, and he's going to, you watch for, this is a model of the way he's teaching, the way he's been directed to do it. Now, the rest are prohibitives. Now, here's what we know about a negative prohibitive as far as the model is concerned. Now, listen to me. The model that we have established in the garden with this is that the negative is going to bring a negative consequences. Agreed? Yeah. I mean, that's the model, isn't it? Where's he getting this idea in Exodus? He's getting an, he, he has modeled that thing in Genesis. It's a negative. A negative command is going to bring a neg negative consequence, isn't it? These things are not going to go well for you, he says. He says, these things are not going to go well for you. They, and listen, we know, we know that the Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments of the Mosaic Law, you know, there's three codes, code one, two, and three. We know that this code is the moral code. You know, there's a spiritual code, a moral code, a social code, a codex. This is a moral codex in the Word of God. And there, it's a moral code of conduct. I've said this before. This, this was on the book, on the wall of the one room schoolhouse I attended. They weren't described as being in the Bible, but the ten, the sixth of the Ten Commandments were on the wall there. That's the way the teacher managed us when we lied or stole or whatever we did. She took us to the wall and said, there, you shouldn't do this. This is why. Here are the, and she called them the rules we live by as students. Here's how, how we live by. It was a moral code. And uh, the moral code is, listen, all the negatives are going to have negative consequences to your life. If you do that, there's going to be a negative. Oh. Well, I've left my exodus for it. There's going to be a negative consequence. If you say shall not, it's a negative consequence. That's what you should walk away from this. 
your days may be prolonged. Your days may be prolonged on earth. Children honor your parents, and there's two sides. To it. One when they're when you're a child in their home, and another was when they're an aged parent in yours. So I teach this a great deal, especially when my kids are at class. <laughs> <clears throat> Point number three. Remember that the prohibitive negative command was directed towards the tree of knowledge. <clears throat> Don't eat. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge. <clears throat> I don't know if curious minds want to know, but I'm a guy who has a curious mind when I... You might be like I. What was the purpose of the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? You can eat of all the other trees in the garden, freely eat. Of this tree, you can't eat. And I'm going, what is that about? What was the purpose of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Let me tell you three, I think. There's probably more. I'm just telling you three that lit my world. Three ideas that lit up my world. In Matthew 4, 4, I get a clue. This is interesting to me. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but live, is the idea, but live on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. See, when it says man shall not live by bread alone, I think that's Genesis 2.16 in context for me. But every word that proceeds my I think that's 2.17. 2.16, you can eat from all the trees. And 2.17, but you can't eat from this one. See, that's the idea. You can't eat from that tree. And why can't I eat from that tree? Listen to me. Here's how simple this is. Because God said so. It's not complicated. God said you can't eat from the tree. Why can't I eat from the tree? Because God said don't eat from the tree. Well, what if I eat from the tree? Then die, you will die. Right? Don't eat from the tree. Well, suppose I eat from it then. Well, then die and you will die. Well, that how can a loving God do that? Well, because he loves you. And the key to you respond to, the, listen to me now, the key of your response to the love of God is to obey him. What does God want back? God loves me. God loves me all the time, all the way, all, everything. What's he want from me? He wants you to obey him. He wants you to obey him. So, one purpose that I see of the tree of knowledge was to teach man the lesson of Matthew 4.4. 4. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Eat from it. Listen, you can eat from all the trees, but that's, that's not all there is to life. Food, clothing, and shelter is not all there is to life. What about your relationship with God? But live on every word that proceeds, every word that is revealed to you from the, as the will of God, you're to obey. Every word that's revealed to you as the directive will of God, you must obey. 
You must obey it. Right? And you say, well, then where am I going to find this knowledge? Where am I going to get this knowledge? I mean, when I ate from the apple tree, I got, a, I got an apple. When I ate from the pear tree, I got a pear. Right? Where am I going to get knowledge if I don't eat from the tree of knowledge? And where am I going to get the knowledge? Because the devil tried to, the devil tried to use that as an argument to eat from it. But God just withholding that he's smarter than you are. Well, you should know that to start with. If I don't, listen, where am I going to get knowledge? How am I going to get the knowledge of of what is good and evil if I don't eat from the tree of knowledge. I ate from every tree that was identified for its fruit. But I'm told I can't eat there. Where am I going to get my knowledge? He met with him every, he met with him periodically for sure in the garden and taught them the word of God like he does with you. And here is the principle, man cannot live by bread alone, but needs every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You need to live on the word that's revealed to you as the directive will of God. You must obey it. You must obey it. Now look, you're going to find it in the Bible, but often somebody has to explain it to you. And so God gave you men who have the gift of teacher. And some of us are nutty enough to take on the pastor side of it. You, you've got to realize this stuff. You've got to realize this stuff. Here's this. And, and look, write this down. It's not in your paper, but write this down. If you want to see how this thing really works out in human life, then write down Acts 8, 30-35 30 with the Ethiopian eunuch trying to figure out the word of God and what he just experienced with Christ dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead, and ascending back to the Father and sending back the Holy Spirit. And he's trying to get, he's trying to get all this straight in his mind somehow, and he can't. And so God sends him Philip, who says, Philip, open the scriptures to his curious mind. And he believed. God needs people like that. Who can explain this to you? The Bible. Yeah, I said I read it and I can't understand it. I hear that all the time. I know. And God gave you men who have the gift of teacher who can set you down and explain it. <clears throat> and listen, it's obvious that there are a lot of people, even a lot of people in Moody, who, who, who don't have the appetite to be able to do that yet. But it will come. I mean, sometimes you sit in class and it's over your head. Right? And that's okay. Your head will, eventually your head will catch up. Eventually your head will catch up. We've all been there. I sat in a class the same way. I just kept, I stuck my head in the class all the time. And eventually my head caught up. I mean, you can't go to kindergarten and graduate with a college degree. As much as we'd all like to. A second purpose for me, a second purpose for the tree of knowledge was to teach believers that the knowledge of good and evil comes from obedience to the directive will of God, which was don't eat. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Because you're not going to get knowledge from the tree, so don't eat. You're going to get college. From, you're going to get knowledge from sitting in Bible class and gutting it out. They get it from sitting in Bible class. They had to sit in Bible class with one of the great teachers of all time, right? The second purpose of the tree of knowledge was to teach believers that the knowledge of good and evil comes from obeying 
don't eat. That, that's, a, that's a command, don't eat. Don't eat. We walk by faith and not by sight, right? We walk by faith and not by sight. The devil pushes sight and doing. He said to Eve, oh man, the tree, the tree, the tree. You want knowledge? Eat. That was his, that was his whole deal. If you want knowledge, why do you say Eve, 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 honey? If you want knowledge, what tree are you going to go to in the garden? You eat. This just, it's a trick play on God's part. When you eat, you're going to be as wise as he is. You're going to be as smart as he is. This is well, Eve, why do you think it's called the tree of knowledge? Listen, that's what he pushes. And, and, and listen, she should have said, yeah, but he said, don't eat. I mean, she did make that argument, but I was told not to eat from it. What tree are you going to eat from and get knowledge then? See, knowledge is not going to come from a tree. It's going to come from the teacher of the word of God. It's not going to come from a tree. You can plant all kinds of trees out here, set under them, it ain't going to do anything. The tree of knowledge was designed to teach obedience to the will of God. Don't eat. That's not how you get a knowledge. It's not how you get divine knowledge of good and evil. You sit in Bible class and get it. And it's for obedience. It's for obedience. Because we walk by faith. So who do you think God pushes faith? Who do you think pushes sight? Satan. No doubt about it. 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 5. We are destroying speculations and every lofted thing raised up against the what? Knowledge. Knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to what? The obedience of Christ. That's how simple this Christian life is. It's not complicated, but it is word-oriented. It's not complicated, but it's word-oriented. The third and final purpose for the tree of knowledge of good and evil was to teach the angelic conflict. And boy, did they learn it. Satan said to Eve, for God knows in the day <laughs> you eat from it, the tree of knowledge, your eyes will be opened. You know the truth of the matter is? Because he lies. You know what's going to happen to their eyes? They're going to get shut. They're going to be closed, not opened. You know how I know it? Listen to me. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. You should write it on your paper. They're going to be as blind as a bat, just like Saul of Tarsus when he was knocked off his mule. He was blind and he had to be led into a city by a man who could open his eyes to the truth of God's word. Paul didn't realize that he was following the will of Satan. God knocked him off his horse or mule or whatever he was riding and caused him to be blind because that's who he was. He thought, and he was religious and thought he was okay because he was religious. He was a part of a religion that was monotheistic, one God, and thought he was in because of that. And God caused him to be blind and sent him to a man that could open his eyes, not only physically, but spiritually. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, 1 John 2.11 would be good verses. The truth is, is that the truth is that if they ate, they would be like Satan, the old serpent. He said, if you eat, you'll be like God. The truth is, when they ate, they were like Satan. They were rebellious to the word of God. You got to remember that. When you disobey God, who are you, whose will are you running? 
You're not running God's. And there's only one other system, and that's the devil's. You've got to be aware of this, people. You've got to be aware of this. Here's sight. Here's, when, here's how Eve was walking by sight. Listen. When the woman saw, watch these words, when the woman saw that the tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, was good for food, that tree was never good for food. In fact, it was forbidden. It was a poisonous tree. Agreed? If you ate, you get poisoned. You're going to die. And that the tree, so that's the first, her eyes, what she saw was the tree was good for food. That's because she's listening to the devil and not to God. That's cosmos diabolicus. And that the tree was a delight to the eyes. Where did that come from? Right? That's her imagination running wild in, the, in cosmos diabolicus thinking. That's evil thinking of the world. And that the tree, look at the, look at many times I put bold print to tree, and the tree was desirable to make one wise. It was very clear in the garden, knowledge didn't come from the tree, it came from the word of God. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. She took from its fruit and ate, and also gave to her husband, and he ate. What's going to happen to both these two people? Dying, dying they're going to die. Dying, they're going to die. They've entered, they have checked out from one thing, living for God, now dying. When you're living for the devil, you're dying for God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Good understanding, a good understanding have all those who do his commandments his praise endures forever. Psalms 111.10. Well, the Enoch Law. Who would have ever known that it would have such an influence upon who we obey and who we live for? Let's, let's have prayer and then we'll do a pledge out of here. Father, We thank you, Father, for these that have come our way today to study with us the Word of God. And I know two hours, even with a break in it, is a lot. And so we, we get sheets of paper to guidance so that people can study them when they go home. They can look at them. And what is our purpose in all of this? We want people who are not saved to be saved, and we want those who are saved to learn the Word of God and become obedient to what the directive will of God is telling them in their life, to be obedient to it. Not my will, but thy will be done. I mean, Father, the Word takes us to the will and the will takes us to the work. What a great formula for our life. I pray, Father, that we would be able to influence people of Moody to stop eating from all the other trees thinking they're going to get knowledge they have to set where the Bible is being taught and adjust their life to the study of the Word of God. And in the beginning, it's difficult for some. It requires a lot more thinking than they've ever been adjusted to and all of that. Man cannot live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the word of God. Word of God. I pray for that today in Moody, and I pray that we could have that influence to be that church that teaches that. In Jesus' name. Amen.